And I think we're rolling. All right. Hit the magic button and we're rolling in three, two, one. And we're going. Thank you for tuning in to Operation Tango Romeo, the Trauma Recovery Podcast for veterans, first responders, and their families. We are on a mission to save lives and relieve pain by making help for BTS injuries easily accessible. The vision of a world where the path to recovery is clear. I am your OPSO, Mark Meinke, and this is Operation Tango Romeo, the Trauma Recovery Podcast. Welcome back, everybody that's tuning in. Once again, we are doing this on Facebook Live and simulcasting on all of my podcast channels. This will be broadcast uh, last Thursday of April, most likely, on all of the podcast channels. And for a full list of the show, you can go to OperationTraumaRecovery.org. That's OperationTraumaRecovery.org. Today on the show, my friend Donna Rigadell is on. And thank you so much for being here, my friend. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, sister. One of the topics that is undercovered on Operation Tango Romeo is MST. I've had one lady out of the States on, and that's it. You know, So it's not completely ignored. But we've got to cover it more and more and more. And then now, of course, in the news with uh, General Vance, <laughs> it is starting to come out. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, it's, I mean, it's a mixed bag. I'm, I'm super proud of those that have come forward because clearly, you know, something's working. They felt supported enough to come forward. And that's great. Of course, I'm still sick and tired and of hearing about our leadership behaving badly. So that's the, the bad side of this. And it's always been there, hasn't it? Um, well, as we were chatting before, I originally came to the military in 1993 and I came back in 2006 and I can say that I've never not had it around. So at least that long. Are we getting better? We are. Uh, we're not getting better fast enough and there are certainly several key pieces still missing. Are more and more people coming forward? Yes, more and more people are coming forward. But one of the pieces that's really missing that um, kind of is heartbreaking is that we're not training people how to support them when they come forward. So it's some people are getting what they need and are then able to sort of start healing. And others, unfortunately, are uh, sent directly down the path of, of more pain and suffering. Is that a big part of that, a lack of empathy for people? Is that, is that where the uh, lack of support is coming? I think some of it is, is a lack of empathy and understanding just how bad the problem is and how it affects the person and, and how it really get insidiously gets into and seeps into every aspect. But I also think that it's just a lack of understanding. The actual way to support somebody is, is pretty simple. Um, and I don't think that there's a lot of malice behind the, the inability to do it. I just don't think they know better. And, and that's my hope, obviously, is that it's, it's born out of ignorance, not malice, and so therefore it can be fixed. Well, what are the top three do's and don'ts of support? Uh, the top three do's and don'ts, it's, it's um, I, will, I believe you is the number one thing. I believe you or I'm sorry this happened to you. Whatever feels more natural in your mouth, that's what you're going to go with. Remind the person that it's not their fault because it isn't. And a lot of um, those victimized carry this guilt around, and it's, it's not theirs to carry. They need to put that burden down. Um, a lot of people feel like they're going crazy. The reactions to being uh, sexually assaulted, especially in the military, because it's such a family environment and you depend on each other so deeply, um, can vary. So you have to remind somebody that, you know, however they're feeling in that moment is normal for them. And their brain will process it however they have to process it. And it's okay. They're not going crazy. They're going to get through this. And the last one, and, and really important, is that they're not alone. The biggest don't by far is any question that starts with the word why, just wipe it out of your mouth. Because no matter how well intentioned, no matter where, what the good place it comes from, it will always put the blame back on that person in some way. It doesn't matter. I learned that lesson with my own mom. My mom came and disclosed an incident to me. And my response back, super well intentioned, I can explain what I meant by it, was why didn't you tell me sooner? 
And what I meant was, oh my God, mom, you've been carrying this around alone for so long. I wanted to be here for you and I wanted to support you and, and be able to help you through this. What came out was, well, why didn't you do this? You know, and that's, that's a very, it's a light blame, but it's still a blame. And when I realized what I had said, I immediately apologized and then explained what I meant by it. But it's really important. Victims are not fragile flowers. Um, they're not delicate little creatures made of glass, especially victims in uniform services. They are, they've gone through the same tough training as everybody else. I call them, you know, badass or tough as nails, if you want to go with that way. They've had to do a really tough job with this extra trauma on top of it. Just imagine that for a second. A lot of these people carry this for days, weeks, months, years before they ever talk about it. So they have to continue on the course when the instructor has done something inappropriate to them. They have to, you know, continue to work with that fire team partner when they've done something that's inappropriate to them. That's incredibly hard. So respect that strength. They don't need you to baby them. What they need is support and understanding. What are some examples of people crossing the line, but not realizing that they're crossing the line? I mean, straight up rape is easy enough. It's like, well, okay, well, that's, we can all agree. Rape is bad. Rape is bad. Uh, rape is bad. Um, but what are the other things where people think, well, you know, that's just teasing or that was just fooling around or uh, that sort of things. So I know that there's a lot of that going around that trivializes and diminishes. What are some examples of that? I can give you an example of a woman that I know um, and she's a, definitely a badass. She's a helicopter pilot, female. She's amazing. Um, she took the survival at sea, or sea course. And the way this course is designed is that um, they spend a certain amount of time in classroom and then they break into raft groups and then spend some time on a raft in the ocean with this group. And then they spend some time alone and they have to sort of go through their drills. And nobody knows how long they're gonna be on these rafts because obviously if you knew, you'd be like, oh yeah, we only got another 30 minutes, we can do it. So it's sort of, you know, it's out there and, and um, nebul you know, not, not sure. So she mentioned that one of the guys in the classroom, she was the only female, and she mentioned that one of the guys in the classroom had started making jokes early on about how well, you know, if it was a group of men, you know, on a raft at sea for months and months at time, you know, men can't go that long without some kind of sexual release. So what would have to happen is one of the guys would have to take one for the team and he'd have to be the bitch in the group. And everybody sort of laughed. And she said, and I laughed too, you know, because it was kind of a, a, you know, a break in sort of the really long injury subject and fine. And then when they broke into raft groups, it so happened that she and he ended up in the group together. And he was like, oh, thank God we got the one girl. So none of us have to be the bitch guys because we got the woman. And she sort of oh, laughed again, a little bit uncomfortable, but you know, at the same time, fine, whatever. And then they were in the raft group. And she said, Donna, we were in the raft for eight hours. And for eight hours, he didn't talk about anything else. That's all he kept talking about. And I didn't know how to make it stop because I'd laughed and I didn't know what to say because I didn't want to, you know, and I said, but that shouldn't have been your responsibility to say something at that point. You've already been singled out. You're already cast in the role of a victim. And at that point, coming forward and saying, you know what, guys, you're making me uncomfortable. Then everybody else just kind of, oh, come on. It's just a joke. You know, no, he doesn't mean anything by it. What had to happen there is she needed somebody to ally themselves and step forward and say, okay, guy, knock it off. And the, what I always say at that point is, hey, if he had talked about anything else for eight hours, if somebody sat in there for eight hours and talked about the Montreal Canadians for eight hours, somebody would, would have told him to fuck off. Exactly. Enough. Shut the fuck up. We're tired of hearing about the haves. Let's move on. So why was this okay? Why did nobody say anything? And I get that it's uncomfortable and it's hard to step forward. But at the same time, if what you are is somebody who's proud to wear a uniform and is ready to serve and follows the ethos, which is respect and dignity to all persons, that means being willing to stand up when stuff like this is going on. So that's a, that's a not so um, quite blatant example, but at the same time should be obvious. Another one is I remember telling a story to a classroom and saying, you know, I remember going on course when I was, you know, 18, 19, and they used to, they would always fly you in like the day before. So you'd arrive on, on base the day before and you'd, you know, get unpacked and get organized. And then you'd have to go to the mess hall for your meals and you'd go and you'd be alone and you'd be in civilians. And I said, I can remember everything stopping when you walk in the room and they're all checking you out and you're getting your food and you're trying to keep your head down and just sort of trying to blend. And I told that story and one of a major in the room said, well, she doesn't know what we're doing. Like she doesn't know why we're, if we're looking at her. And I looked at him first, I first, I was incredulous that he would do that, but I looked at him and I said, okay, let's switch it up. And he said, okay, I said, let's say instead of the one woman, it's the one black man walks in and everybody stops and stares. Do you think he doesn't know what's going on? And he said, well, that's racist. And I said, then why would it be different? It's uncomfortable. Don't do it. 
So it becomes a matter of whenever, and I'm not trying to leave, leave male victims out because there are a lot of them. And, but overwhelmingly, even when the victim is a male, it's still a male offending. That doesn't mean there's no female offenders out there. It just means that statistically, this is tilted heavily in the area of, of men being the offenders. And they're not always, it's not always, um, cause they're, oh, they were so, it's not always sexual gratification that's the key. It's always power, but some, especially with men, it's often under the guise of hazing or it's just a joke, yeah. or we were just having a good time. Whereas with women, there's, it's often you know, not that way. There are other ways to build morale. You shouldn't have to do it on somebody else's dignity. How do you describe the line? Um, the line it, that shouldn't be crossed. I describe the line that shouldn't be crossed as, because people always say, well, what's the difference between flirting and harassment? You know, and my first is if you can't tell the difference, you should probably stop flirting. But flirting is mu- <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, flirting is mutual. If both of you are giving as good as you get, if there's, if when you walk into the room, you both look up and you smile and you're chatting and it's friendly, you're probably okay. Now, I'm not going to swear on a stack of Bibles because it's always a risk you're taking, but you're probably okay. But if you've been coming in every and saying good morning oh you look so nice oh, today. Hang on. And all of a sudden you start to notice that when you come in their head is down and they're not really looking up and they're not giving you their full attention and they're turning their body away from you and not really facing you and they're not engaging maybe it's time to check yourself and maybe you're you're crossing the line and i know that it's just good morning to you but you don't know what that person's thinking one of the scenarios that i use in the training is a person comes into a unit and the um it's and it's a civilian tr- um person that runs the unit but they're sort of in the person's space constantly and they're always trying to offer them help and you know oh let me show it's a it's a vehicle mechanic so it's like oh let me show you how to turn your wrench properly you're not doing that and they reach around them and they're leaning into them and it gets to a point where they ask they say you know what i like to take the new ones out for lunch i'd like to take you out for lunch and we can discuss you know the the culture of the unit and how you can best blend in and they when people see it and they and they read it they realize how uncomfortable it is that's how is that person supposed to say no they can't. There's there's no earthly way for them to turn around and say, you know what, I really don't want to go for lunch or I'm not really comfortable without potentially alienating their new boss. So when you flip it on the side and you say, okay, that's how you can tell the line on an exploitative relationship. I use the example, somebody called me the other day to talk about, of course, the, the accusations and the allegations against General Vance. And um, they said, well, you know, everybody says that the relationship was consensual. And I said, okay, let's play this out for a second. And I said, first of all, let's assume that all the allegations are true. Okay, because obviously the investigation is still ongoing and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. But let's say for the sake of argument, all the allegations are true. And I said, do you have the CDS engaged in an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate? And they said, yeah. And I said, do you think at any point she felt free to end it? And there's a long pause. And I said, exactly. That's a problem. It doesn't matter if it started off and they were both, you know, gung ho about it. As soon as it got to a point where he knew that he was, he could exert power in her career, he should have ended it. Especially a direct report. Especially. Oh my God. Especially a direct report. There is a, there is a lack of accountability right now. And I don't know if it's because we're so worried about losing people. So we don't want to, you know, push it or what, but I had a, person come to me, they were in a unit in Ontario, and they'd had an inappropriate picture taken of them while they were changing. And it quickly made its way out to everybody in the unit. And I said, well, she said she went to the chain of command. I said, what did the chain of command say? And she said, well, they said they couldn't do anything. And I sat back and I said, bullshit. And she said, what? I said, what's wrong with holding you in a meeting and saying, if I catch a single person forwarding, saving, talking about this picture, you will be charged and then follow it up and do it. I don't care if you catch the CO with it, charge that person, but only take one or two and quickly everybody would realize that they're serious and that picture would go away it's not rocket science we have an organization that is incredibly that has this incredible tool of power in the chain of command and the ability to use it positively but there just seems to be reluctance to actually do it so it comes down to we need to empower our leaders to be able to do that kind of thing without necessarily having you know reprimands on their files now and be able to exert that on people properly and appropriately when it's needed I'm going to ask you the tough question now, and it is tough. Um, And it's one that needs to be talked about more, which is the impact on people's lives from an MST, the effects, the symptoms. What does that look like in somebody's life? How does, how does it change their life? I can tell you that for me, I joined the reserves when I was 17. I got out when I was 21. Um, When I joined when I was 17, I wanted to be a doctor. 
Um, I wanted to, I was hoping to maybe do that through the military and go through the MOTP program. At the time, I didn't know what the program was called, but I knew that I could do that. Um, I left in, at the age of 21 completely devastated. Um, I had gone to, I'd gone on a course and I had been sexually assaulted by an instructor. And I went to my chief clerk to ask for a leave of absence because I was finding myself, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating. I'm about five, my daughter says I'm 5'10", I still say I'm 5'9". Um, but I was down to about 110 pounds. Um, I wasn't sleeping at night. I was walking my house at night, not able to sleep. I was not um, dealing with anything well. I can remember going on a winter uh, warfare training and I couldn't, I was, you know, you're on snowshoes with all your kit and I fell down on one knee and I couldn't physically stand back up. I was so weak from everything that had been happening. So I went to my chief clerk and I said, I need a leave of absence. I've got to work through some stuff. I couldn't say the words yet, but that's what I knew I needed. And she looked right at me and she said, um, you're a whore and a slut and an administrative burden and you need to get out before we throw you out. So I left and I left. Um, so what the result of that was on me. Why did she I, say that? Um, so when I got back from basic training, again, I was 17 and I was the youngest female on my basic training. Um, when I got back, there was, I can remember dating somebody in my unit and um, he was absolutely shocked to find out that I was a virgin when we started dating. And he had said to me that when he told his buddy who had been on my course um, as staff, that he was asking me out, his buddy said, well, you better bring a lot of condoms because we didn't call her the mattress on course for nothing. And I said, how is that even possible? I didn't do anything on my basic training. I didn't go, I was too young to go out drinking age in BC where I did, it was 19. I was, everybody else was like, we're going partying. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go curl up with a book. Like I was literally not the person that was even out and about with them. And yet still I came back with this reputation and it apparently followed me. And it was, um, it was really hard to hear. Um, I know that that he stood up for me at the time, but at the same time, I was just flabbergasted that, that would even happen. So yeah, so that was her response. Um, I left the military. I didn't, I did not, I actually didn't even graduate from high school on time. It took me another year to get around to it. It, uh, I ended up in a relationship and in a marriage that was very toxic and I didn't set up good boundaries and it ended up devolving into a really an emotionally abusive relationship. Actually, when, when my marriage split up, I can remember um, a fight we were having and him, because at that point I'd come forward and said that this had happened to me. And his response was, you should have told me you were sexually assaulted because I never would have married you if I knew you were broken. Jesus. Uh, yeah. So uh, I packed up my daughter and my dogs um, and everything. And we moved across Canada in 2017 and we left and now we're healing. My daughter has secondary PTSD from, mm. of course, from the, from the toxic and abusive environment that I wasn't aware enough to, to understand. Um, there's studies done on trauma victims. And what they say is because we spend so much time at that really heightened vigilance, we miss um, red flags that you would normally see earlier because we're watching for the big ones and we're always feeling like on edge. So because of that, we don't recognize when something should be pinging our spidey sense and telling us that this, is, this could be dangerous. So we, that's why victims often say, what do I have victim tattooed on my forehead? Why does this keep happening to me? That's why it's not that you have, it's that you don't recognize the signs because you spend all of your time at that level. So you don't notice the difference when, yeah, when everybody else's emergency is just our uh, standard operating speed. Exactly. So I actually described it. It took me a while to somebody said, well, what does PTSD do in your life? And what is it like? And I said, have you ever read the article? There's an article, um, a sound that they use in horror movies. And I said, it's, and it's lower than your conscious understanding. You don't hear it in the same way, but your body hears it. And I said, and it's a sound that's designed to make you uncomfortable. It's at a resonance where it puts you on edge. And they do that on purpose in horror movies to put you on edge so that you're ready for the scare. And I said, it's like living life with that all the time. You're always on edge and you're always ready for something bad to happen. But in that, bad things happen more often because you can't recognize them in the early stages because you're already there. So that's what it's like. So it derailed my dream. Um, it derailed um, what should have been, I should have gotten into a healthy relationship and um, been in a better place. I would be retiring right now from the military with a full pension if I had gone in and been full, you know, at the time that I wanted to. Um, so it basically completely changed the course of my life. I, I am now 
um, soon to be 45 in less than a month. Um, I'm in a medical release process from the military due to PTSD, due to military sexual trauma. Uh, I suffer from the uh, same problem that a lot of, and I don't know if this affects men the same way. I know it affects women. I have a hard time going to the gym and staying physically fit or working on my physical fitness because it comes with the scare that as you make improvements on yourself, therefore making yourself more attractive, you run the risk of crossing potential predators more often. Even though we know, and I know logically, sexual assault has nothing to do with physical attractiveness, it just comes to a point where you're like, I don't want to attract any more attention. So you, a lot of people put on weight, um, you know, won't put as much effort into themselves because they're like, if I'm unattractive, then people will leave me alone. That's not entirely true, but at the same time, it becomes a point where you're not able to do good things for yourself because one, you don't think you deserve them, but two, because if I do and, and I you know, make these self-improvements, what if that brings bad people into my life? I don't want to do that. So you end up sort of insulating yourself against that through your own um, lack of fitness and lack of self-effort, which is really sad because we all deserve to be the best versions of ourselves. Um, so I'm going to be medically released from the military probably in about a year. We'll see. Um, I know that there's some interest in what we're working on now, so we'll see what happens. But I intend now to apply to medical school and be a 46-year-old, you know, freshman in medicine. So um, it's scary because, you know, I have all these 20-year-olds saying, I don't know, maybe it's too late for me to pursue this dream. And I want to say, fuck off. Like, seriously? So, you know, I'm going to do it. Um, I want to be a trauma-informed healthcare provider. My main goal in life is to continue to advocate and be an activist for better victim support and helping get at the roots of that sexualized culture. So if I can do that with a doctor in front of my name, I will. So a, psychology, a doctor of psychology or? No, I want to be a trauma. I want to be on the first, I want to be in the emergency room when people okay. come in. I want to be there because when somebody comes in, um, as a result of sexual assault, I want to be the first person they disclose to because I want to support them and I want to get them back on. I want to start them on the path to healing, not only physically, of course, but also mentally and spiritually. Sometimes our greatest challenge can become our superpower. And that is what created Tango Romeo. And that's what created Survivor Perspectives Consulting Group. Tell me about your group. We uh, were brand new because a lot of people are like, we haven't heard of you yet. And I said, well, yes, we started. What day is it today? We actually started this last week. Um, we had a loose group of survivors already talking, but inventing about our continued exhaustion of hearing the chain of command and honestly watching them spin their tires for so long. Um, I went to them and I said, I have my little group and we we're talking about what we could do. And I said, well, the, you know, the government's not, this chain of command is not talking to survivors and they need to be, they need to be engaging with us and saying, you know, what, what is better wording than what we're using? Does this policy make sense? You know, can you look over our thoughts for this and see if there's, if there's a way that you can consult on it? And I said, but of course the issue with that is they don't know who to reach out to. They don't want to reach out to somebody and re-traumatize them either. So they need to find not only survivors, but survivors that are long enough into their healing that they're prepared to now come back and do it in an empowering way. So we knew that where we were and we knew where our skills were. So we had, we have a designer, we have some staff officers, we have some NCMs and we're all kind of working together on making this happen. So what we want to do is help the chain of command, first of all, not continue to shoot themselves in the feet by, you know, saying the wrong thing and, and alienating the survivors out there and causing more pain to people that are still in. But also, um, I have a course. Now, I've taken a lot of training in both victim support and in sort of the roots of, we call it the roots of gender violence, but the same roots are with racism. Any sort of hateful behavior has the same kind of um, start. Um, so it's examining those roots of gender violence. And again, you said it yourself people have an idea what a rape looks like. Okay, we know rape is bad. We, we will stop rape if it's happening. But it comes down to rape doesn't happen immediately. There's all these steps leading up to it. And maybe it starts with a joke. Maybe it starts with, um, you know, a picture being circulated. Maybe it starts with all this kind of stuff. So how do you intervene on that? Well, in the past, the chain of commands products have been things to the commanders like, okay, so when a victim comes to you, be empathetic. Okay, what does that mean to, you know, a battle weary, CEO who's just gotten back from operations be empathetic to what what do you, what do you want me to do what, what does so, it, you know what does it mean and how do you do it exactly and it's not rocket science it's fairly simple but it just comes down to teaching it and drilling it the same way that we do anything else in life that's important I refer to it as first aid for a very specific kind of injury we're not trying to you make just doctors. Froze on me. we're not trying to make surgeons 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're back. We're not tr okay. We're not trying to make doctors or surgeons or anything else. What we're trying to do is say, if somebody presents to you with this kind of injury, how do you stop the bleeding in that moment and then get them to help? Well, this is how you do it. You tell them right off the bat, something along the lines of, I believe you, or I'm sorry this happened to you. Because a lot of survivors don't want to come forward because they worry they're not going to be believed. They worry that somebody's going to say to them, that didn't happen. I don't believe you, whatever. So right away, reassure them that you're on the same page, that you understand that they're in pain and you're ready to listen. Then it's, I, none of this is your fault. We survivors take on so much guilt and so much shame. And we try to believe that if we do everything right, bad things won't happen to us. So if a bad thing happens to us, we must have done something wrong. That's not the way the world works. And that's terrifying because the reality is you can do everything right and something bad can still happen to you. That's too much for us to take on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to believe that we have some control over it. In this situation, you really need to reassure them that it's not their fault. And hopefully at some point, they'll be ready to put that burden down and not carry it anymore. None of this is your fault. Whatever they're feeling or thinking at the time is normal. I've had people say to me, you know what, after it happened, I had some really, really dirty dreams. Did this and in men vic victims that are men particularly suffer from this because a lot of times their bodies will respond physiologically to the attack and they're like, I ejaculated, I got a heart on, like I, you know, the 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 feeling itself was pleasurable, but it was totally offensive to me. Absolutely, and I understand that, and that's it's not you that enjoyed it. It's it's just your body responding to a stimulus. So whatever you're feeling about this is normal. Your body is processing it and your mind is processing it however it needs to. And the final one is you're not alone anymore. This is a very lonely place to be, to be a survivor, a victim coming forward. It changes the way people look at you in a really horrible way. And that's hard to see and it's hard to feel. So you need to remind those people that, you know what, there's a whole, I mean, for lack of a better word, there's a whole army of people ready to support them and ready to get them through the next step. I think we talked about uh, General Vance before I hit record. Wasn't it before I hit record? I don't think so. Well, uh, let's let's circle back to it. I, I want to drill down a bit. Um, so people will be looking at the General Vance situation, going, "Well, it was it was a consensual relationship." My response to that is always, um, "Do you think once, especially once he was obviously CDS, but once he was in her direct chain of command, do you think she was ever at a point where she could have ended it?" Yeah. No, I, the example from my life is I had an instructor, um, on my basic training, um, attempt to order me to give them a blowjob. And, uh, when I think back to it now, I was 17 years old again, I've said that a couple of times, I was 17 years old and I think back to 17 year old me and what she was thinking at that time. And what really strikes me is my train of thought at the time was how can I get out of this without making him angry? How can I reject this without offending him to the point that he's going to fail me on basic training and I'm going to have to do this all over again? And how sad that is. But that's what my thought was. It wasn't how dare you or that's disgusting. I'm going to report you or, you know, that this is offensive to me or any of that. It was how do I make this stop but not make him angry? And that's horrible. And that's what I think about when I hear about the general van stuff. It's, you know what, even if... Um, she got to the point where she was like, you know what, I really need this to stop because it's affecting me, it's affecting my career, it's impacting my life in so many negative ways. How does she do that without making him angry? How do you say to somebody with that much power, I want this to stop? And you people can't. have to understand the CDS is the chief of defense staff. So that's the top soldier. There is nobody the ranked higher. No. It's the top soldier. And even if you are yourself a general, the CDS can make or break your career. Absolutely. So if you displease the king, the king can do whatever the fuck he wants. Well, and even more than that, everybody where you're else posted because, anything. And other people were like, well, they knew what was going on. Do you think those people looked at her without disdain? Do you think that there was ever like, you know what, if, if she didn't get posted, she didn't go, you asked for it. Or anything she did justifiably earn. Everybody I've talked to has said she's she's an excellent staff officer. I, I sort of know her. We've emailed back and forth, but I've never actually met her face to face. But do you think there was anybody who didn't put a little asterisk beside her name when she was promoted or put on a course or got a, or got something else that maybe was considered a bit of a Gucci go that was like, well, you know how she got that. That's yeah. a terrible thing to carry on with you. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter what kind of accomplishments you have, people will be saying, well, it's because she sucked his dick. And that's exactly how they say it. And it's gross. And, but that's why I said it that way, because that's exactly the words that are said. And, um, and, and, that's, and that's how they're treated. 
that is how they're treated. Every woman in uniform that goes into a new unit or a new job or anything has to reprove that they're capable of doing the job. Yeah. And that's sad. I've, I've faced it myself so many times where you come in and you have to prove that you're not a bag of hammers because everybody's like, well, you know, she could be, she could have gotten this job because of whatever, because, you know, because she's got good tits or whatever. And you come in and you're like, no, actually. And they're like, wow, you're actually capable. Well, why would you assume otherwise? Yeah. Even back in, back in my day, when we were here, uh, our, a, our AVGP hey, was the our dinosaur. Back in the day was the same, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I remember a warrant going with um, uh, a major, you know, but it was different trades and they weren't directly linked and there was no direct reporting going on. So it was good. And also, the major was a lady and the warrant was a dude so that was also the thing that was um over overlooked you know because of that but um but it was still it was it, it was dodgy and it was touch and go and i was like well how are they getting away with that because we knew that you're not allowed to do that you know it's uh, you're not allowed to fraternize within the unit period but uh, at least you're not supposed to but um when there's that big of a i mean for people that don't know, a warrant is a senior NCO. Um, that's it's a been there, done that kind of rank, and you're in charge of a, you know at, at least thirty people, at least. But um, a, a major can be the two IC for an entire com- um, battalion, you know, and they could be the second in charge for a couple thousand people. So that's that's a big difference in rank. I think the only way to do it, because it's, here's the thing, and I know, I know the no fraudization rule, I'm, I'm well aware of it, I've heard it a lot, um, but as long as you're going to have people working together, you're going to have people building relationships together. Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to be the, the way of things. So how do you do it in a way that's transparent and um, less, less fraught with peril, for lack of a better way to put it? A transparency would be a big one, making sure that neither one is in control or able to influence the other's career trajectory. Um, But I think that it has to be really out in the open and I think it has to be really um, identified, similar to in corporations where you have to disclose your relationship to human resources and they make sure that your paths don't cross that way. When I was, um, you know, before I was married, obviously years ago, I did date somebody within my unit. We were together for, you know, two, two and a half years or so. And, Uh, He was one rank, usually one rank. At one point, he was two ranks because he didn't know, still one rank above me. But we were never in each other's, um, he was always attached to somebody else. He always worked with a different group of people. And when we were at work, we were at work. Like I I referred to him by his rank and he referred to my rank. And so much so that somebody actually commented once and said, I can't believe that you guys, and I said, we're at work. When you're at work, you're professional, period. You know, this doesn't cross into this. So you don't mix the two and you're careful not to mix the two. And, and there is a way to do it and be above board with it. Um, but that was clearly not the case if the allegations are true. So I think that if nothing else, we need a leadership that is more accountable to that, that it's, it's not, you know, do as I say, not as I do, that everything is out in the open and, and very transparent and making sure that there are, are guidelines to follow. And yeah, it does mean, you know, guidelining people's personal lives a little bit. Well, you know, if you want a job where you're 24 seven in the job like ours, then that has to be that way. So I think that there's a way to do it properly and safely, but obviously it was not in this case. When you suffer a traumatic injury, it is something that you, you just can't shake off. Uh, people say, oh, it's all in your head. Well, it's, it's in your soul, man. And I just had the conversation yesterday with a couple of uh, people with master's degrees and they say, yeah, you, you never actually get over it. it. Like there is no 100% healing. It doesn't happen. But what does happen is you get better and better at dealing with it and being healthier and healthier uh, to combat and counterbalance the injuries. What are some of the top coping and healing um modalities that you use personally to to get through the day and through keep living life 
Um, I think it, some of it comes down to knowing yourself and knowing when you are sliding. Um, nobody wakes up and says, okay, that's it. I mean, I'm in a depressive state now and I can't move. And I'm just going to, there are signs, little signs that come in before that. So it's recognizing those before you get to that point and then making allowances for it. Yes, we are different. We have PTSD and that's going to be, um, sadly a partner in your life forever now. And we didn't want it. It's an ugly baby that's going to follow us around forever. Um, like herpes. Like, kind of like herpes. I prefer to call it like a scar. <laughs> but, <laughs> herpes, sure. but it flares so, up every now and then. It flares up every now and then. Um, so it's, it's being really honest with yourself, being gentle with yourself. Because you can't um, muscle through this. No. You can't. No. You can't. So it's, no. But and it's not it's, hopeless either. It's not hopeless. It doesn't have to define you. It doesn't have to be your be all end all. It doesn't have to be your steady state. What it has to do though, is you have to um, know that some days you're gonna be really productive and other days you're gonna brush your teeth. So know that, know the difference. Um, don't beat yourself up on those days where you're dealing with stuff. Sometimes it helps me when I can come to a cause of it. It's, I'm going to talk to the women for a second out there. It's kind of like when you're in a really bad mood and everything's getting to you and then your period starts and you're like, oh, that's why. It's sort of like that where mm. everything's getting to you all of a sudden and you're feeling really edgy and you're like, what the is the matter with me? And then you're like, wait a second. Right. Okay. I just realized it's coming up on an anniversary or the weather's right. And this is how the weather was that day. Or I just saw somebody wearing a blue t-shirt and that reminded me. So sometimes it helps when you can find a logical reason to why you're feeling that at least it helps me. Cause then I'm, I can say, okay, that's why I'm not crazy. I'm processing. Got it. Okay. So cut yourself some slack on those days where you can't do it. And that requires Sometimes you're going to have to lean on your friends. I've had to educate my friends and family very much on um, what that means. I was once upon a time, you know, kind of the life of the party, the really funny one. And, you know, the one that keeps all the conversations going. And sometimes I'm still that person, but sometimes I'm not. So when, um, you know, your sister says to, I really want you to come out and meet your work, my work friends. I've told them you're really funny, which by the way, sucks. Don't ever do that to people because then they're like, God, I got to be funny too. So <laughs> and my response to her was, I'm not up to it. And she says, oh, come on. Can't you just, I'm not up to it. Oh, just, you know, you'll feel better once you go. Out. No, I'm not up to it. I barely got out of bed this morning. I cannot go out and put myself out there. And I have to recognize my own limits. And this is one of them. And recognize that, you know, you're going to need to charge your battery. I've just done, you know, a really busy week of media interviews and engagements. I know that this weekend is going to be kind of really low key. And that's okay. I'm going to allow myself that and then I'll come back hard next week. So recognize that some things are going to slide off, slide off the, and that's okay. Like my house right now is kind of a shambles. I tried to keep, make sure that there was no garbage in the shot when I moved stuff around. I know that I'll get to it. It doesn't stay like this. I'm not a hoarder. It's going to be okay. But right now it's, <laughs> it's going to be messy and that's okay. And, and I'll get to it and we'll clean it up and we'll get it back up to speed and, and we'll be good. But that was something that had to give. So it gave a little bit, you know, like you make yourself shortcuts. My daughter and I both have disordered eating because of trauma. And I know that. So yesterday was, was a bad day for eating. We had, I think we sat down for one kind of meal together and then everything. So I have in the pantry meal replacement shakes. So if nothing else, I know before I go to bed, I have to have one of those because your body needs it. So you make sure that you get that down the hatch and then you can say, okay, tomorrow will be better. I'll make a better effort tomorrow. And you try, but you give yourself little tricks like that, little shortcuts like that. You're, you're kind to yourself, you're gentle to yourself and you ask, and you have to be ready to ask for understanding from others. And that can be really tough because like I said, it kind of changes the way they look at you, but at the same time you have to, you can't it's go such through a life without delicate, your delicate balance between making excuses and taking responsibility and, and, um, uh, and, and being kind to yourself, you know, it is. it's, it, it's this constant struggle of, no, it's okay for me to uh, underperform today because this is actually, this is the best I can do today. And just being it okay is. with it and letting it go as instead of feeling extra shitty all day because not only are you not getting it done, but uh, you feel shitty about not getting it done instead of letting it go. You know what, though? I will say to everybody out there suffering from trauma, um, a great equalizer is going on right now. I've had so many people reach out to me and they're like, I don't know what's wrong with me, but you know, we've been on isolation and lockdown and this and this and this. And I say, that's your body's trauma response. And there's this long pause. And I said, welcome to it. Um, find somebody nearby that's got PTSD and they'll give you some coping strategies because guess what? You're having it too. 
Like right now, there is really a global trauma experience going on and everybody's going through it together. So what a great way to now say, hey, remember about halfway through isolation when we were all suffering and having a really hard time with it? That's like it is for me every other week or every couple of days or every day if, if you're that at that point in your recovery. So it's a good way to ask for some understanding because they've got it now. It's just a matter of tapping into it. Donna, I think we're about there, but uh, we're going to have to do this again and swing around and, and have you back on. But thank sure. you so much. Is there any parting, if you were to put a message in a bottle <laughs> for future generations, what would you, what would it say in there? Uh, for future generations, what I would say is um, be kind to yourself, recognize when you're having off days, um, use the days that are good to their maximum potential, and remember that you are not defined by your trauma, but how you rise up and, and what you decide to do with it after. And it's okay to take some time off to heal, but don't stay there. Make sure that you get some closure, however, whatever that means for you, and then start to start to chase back your life and start to pull back the parts of yourself that you miss and that you want to keep. Um, and that you're able to, and the rest of it, you've got to let it go. I totally ripped off the message in a bottle thing from my friend, Sonia Morton Firth. So you have full credit, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> that works for me. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, do the closeout, uh, which will end us, and then I'll give you a call back. Let's chat a bit more. Sounds good. All right. You're listening to Operation Tango Romeo. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in to Operation Tango Romeo, the Trauma Recovery Podcast for veterans, first responders, and their families. We are on a mission to save lives and relieve pain by making help for PTS injuries easily accessible. With the vision of the world, the path to recovery is clear. Fancy. I am your OPSO, Mark Meinke, and this is Operation Tango Romeo, the Trauma Recovery Podcast. That one's dead. I'll kill this and then I'll give you a call. Cool. Cheers.